So why am I trying to make this, you know, trap that I don't <laughs> have any relationship to or any, you know, like real tie to, you know, or even like this electro house that was just noisy and, you know, hype. And it's like, I'm not, I'm not noisy and I'm not hype. I'm pretty chill and relaxed. So finding like finding your voice is really kind of um, you know like that song helped me find my my musical voice. Today, right, let's get cracking because we've got a lot of stuff to listen to. I've got a lot of chatter. I've got a super super interesting, it's going to be great fun today. A really interesting album we're going to listen to. So I'm excited today. I'm going to welcome Devin James after a lifetime spent in and around the music industry, soaking up the influences of legends across the genres and flexing his musical muscles. Uh, in all corners of the dance world, Devin James has released his debut album, um, Love Reaches, a nine-track narrative of self-discovery through catchy disco hooks, self-assured indie grooves, and swinging house rhythm. Sonically, it, it synthesizes a decade's worth of dance floor, elation, global travel, heartbreak, you name it, it's in there. I've spoken to Devin so much on email. I was just saying off before we got on air, we spoke so much on email. I've never actually spoke to him yet or have a voice note. So it's been great to actually speak to him and talk about the album. We're going to listen to the album. It's lush. I've been listening to it a bit loads recently. Um, I had it on big on this morning. So, gang in the chat, let's give Devin all the emotes in the big emote welcome. Let's get him in here. No. There. Yay. Devin James, welcome to the Disco Shed. And welcome to Twitch. How are you doing, dude? Excellent. Excellent. It's uh, it's a, about 8 a.m. here in... Uh, I'm outside of Boston. I live outside of Boston right now. So I'm um, yep. just waking up, starting my day with uh, with you and the, the gang here on Twitch. Welcome in, man. Uh, so you're in Boston. Yeah, I was going to ask where you are. I've never been to Boston. I'd love to go there. Yeah, it's a cool, uh, this is kind of, this is where I'm from, um, where I grew up around, um, you know, I'm like 25 minutes outside the city of Boston. I actually kind of ended up here by accident, you know, during the pandemic and stuff. Uh, I was, I was in New York since 2011 and um, was getting ready to get, get out and uh, spent a little bit of time in Detroit, living in Detroit for a while. Um, and I was about to move to Denver right before the pandemic. And then, uh, you know, all of our lives changed and we <laughs> yeah. all ended up in some place that we, you know, didn't think we'd end up or something. And, um, yeah, so I'm back here in Boston for a little while, but, um, kind of a transition place for me. I'm not, not somewhere I want to stay for a while. You know, I'm looking to get out soon. Uh, right. Before we get into the album and get serious on, uh, on my Twitch streams, it's lunchtime here in the UK and we have a, we have a, we are into the meal deal and, Basically, this is kind of something you get from the, the supermarkets. You get them from the convenience stores. Uh, it's basically the sandwich, confectionery, and like crisp combo, drink combo. Uh, mine was always the kind of breakfast triple sandwich. It's like super unhealthy, like big white bread, sausage and bacon in a sandwich. Three, It's a three pack as well, so it's extra, extra unhealthy. Uh, definitely some quavers and it used to be one of those uh, smoothie drinks that like you think are really healthy kind of level it out but they're, they're really not because of all the sugar I know that you probably don't get them in the United States but what is your go-to lunch or do you have a go-to lunch that you that is your favorite I do actually yeah I just became a regular at my local sandwich shop so they call they know that I'm calling they go hey Devin you want the regular today <laughs> so uh <laughs> nice what yeah. is the regular oh, yeah. tell me oh uh, yeah always wanted that but it's a um it's um what do you call it? it's a caesar wrap like a caesar yep. salad wrap but without the dressing <laughs> that's cool i like the dressing why, why no dressing yeah uh i'm just i don't know i have some weird like things like that i think it's more of like a texture thing from when i was a kid like i didn't like salad dressing on salads so now kind of like just naturally we'll get like i do do dressing sometimes and sauces but i'll do it on the side but i mm -hmm. used to like you know i used to eat a burger like absolutely plain like the pat like you know the bun the patty yeah. and then the top of the bun and that was it that's how my daughter has it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I ate, I ate like a six-year-old for uh, probably like 14 years of my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, so you, so you have, so you have a dry Caesar, a dry yeah. Caesar. 
Tactics. But then, uh, yeah, for chips, I got um, – we've got uh, – you might have seen them over there, but uh, we've got Cape Cod potato chips over here. They're like kettle cooked. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah. Fancy, fancy, fancy little crisps. Um, yep. And then usually I go for the kombucha. What's a kombucha? Um, it's like a probiotic. It's supposed to be like oh, some yeah. healthy drink. You know, it's like good for your gut. But um, yep. it's, I actually made it for a little while too. And it's kind of gross to make because you have this little like giant booger looking thing that's called a SCOBY, um, the symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And it's kind of like beer, you know, like it, it um, you put it in some mm-hmm. sugary tea. And then the sugar eats all the bacteria and creates, you know, some good bacteria and then you drink it. <laughs> no way. Holy moly. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I want one of those. That sounds cool. Yeah, we'll we'll bring them out in Ibiza. I'm sure there'll be plenty out there. <laughs> nice. Okay, cool. Well, that sounds like a good lunch. I'm I'm well into that. That's cool. I'm not sure about the dry Caesar though. I definitely want the sauce. I'm yeah. I definitely love a sauce. <laughs> cool. Well, let's jump into um, congratulations on the album. Like I read that it's a, t- a 10 year process. So I definitely want to hear about that, but I thought we would just start with you. Like, let's talk about you. Like I heard your grandfather is, is in, was brought you into music. Can you tell us about your kind of growing up your history and kind of where it started for you? Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, my grandfather, um, <laughs> so this is kind of funny. Um, my grandparents met in marching band at their high school. <laughs> Yeah. No and yeah, my, uh, my grandfather was a tuba player and my grandmother was a drummer. Uh, she played the bass drum, <laughs> but so, yeah. Um, so they met and, um, you know, they were both musical and, and, uh, they had my dad when they were actually fairly young, especially for that era. You know, they, I think they were like 16 when they had my dad. Um, no and that is, he was born in 1958. So, uh, you know, definitely a different time back then. Not a lot of people had kids at that young, but, um, but yeah, they did it. They made it work. Um, my grandfather, you know, had his regular job. I think he used to work for like computers and uh, I think he worked like the Xerox company or something at first, but you know, he always did music on the side as well. And, um, one of the, um, you know, the kind of big gigs that he had, he played uh, tuba in a for a club actually called Your Father's Mustache, and they were a chain of clubs all over the all over the country, and they were the biggest distributor of draft beer and peanuts <laughs> for a while. So, um, no way, you know, just like yeah, just like an old style kind of place, like you know, wooden benches, wooden tables, people in there singing and, you know, just drinking and listening to Dixieland jazz. Um, so he did that and, and toured the circuit and did a lot of those clubs all around the country, played a bunch of different vet jazz festivals here and there. He still plays to this day. He's like 80. Uh, I think he just turned 81 um, last no month way. or a couple months ago. Yeah. So he's still doing it. Um, you know, super inspiring. Uh, it's really kind of cool to see that he's been able to, um, you know, kind of balance like a, you know, a, a normal, normal life, uh, with doing his, um, you know, his musician thing. So he actually, um, one really cool thing that, uh, about your father's mustache thing is I got to see, they did like a, I think it was a 50 year reunion or something like that, 50 year anniversary. And they did a big performance at Carnegie hall in New York. Yeah. So that was super cool to see and be there. And it was me and my dad, and my sister went, you know, so it was really nice. And then, um, but yeah, so that kind of my dad, um, you know, obviously, was brought up in a musical household. He was playing mm-hmm. piano since he was a little kid. Um, used to play in like rock bands. He his his thing growing up was like fusion rock. He really liked, you know, like Yes and Steely Dan, Doobie Brothers, stuff like that. He uh, you know, was kind of doing that thing for a while, but then went to school to be um, an occupational therapist assistant. <laughs> and that's, that's how cool. he met my mom. Yeah, my mom's an OT. It's like, um, so that's kind of how they met, but um while they were, when they first started dating, uh, my dad was, had a friend, I think it was a friend that they both worked with or something. She was a singer and Mm -hmm. she needed, um, a keyboard player to go and audition with her for this band. And my dad went with this girl to, to accompany her and she didn't get the gig, but they asked my dad to stick around and they're like, well, we actually need a (laughs) keyboard player. And uh, I'm I'm unsure if the group was the group that he's with now, but, um, or if it was just someone that was in the group that, that uh, brought him into another project, but he is currently the keyboard player. Well, this went on to, um, 
to lead to him playing keyboards with the Scatolites, which is, uh, you know, very, very legendary um, Jamaican ska reggae band. They're one of the originators of the music. So that's very cool. So you see my Jamaican so that, flag there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bar, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's cool. So then, yeah. so then you must have like your household my growing up must be mad, just so much different music. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, my mom, she's, uh, she doesn't really play music. She played a little bit of guitar here and there. Um, but we always had a guitar growing up. I picked up guitar when I was like nine years old. Um, and yeah, definitely very, very varied, um, you know, kind of taste between the two of them and, and even their friends that, that were around and stuff like that. You know, my, my mom really loved obviously the Beatles. I, I was just talking with her about this last night, but, uh, my mom, she was into horseback riding and she went to, um, to England to do like a horse master's school because she wanted to compete in the Olympics. And when she was there, when she was 18, that was during the time when the Beatles were working on the white album and, and, uh, nice. doing all those rehearsals at the Apple, Apple studios. And mm. she was there and saw them play live on the roof of the Apple tower in England. What the fuck? That's yeah. cool. Yeah, That's she very went to cool. Woodstock as well. So no way. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Holy so between, moly. Yeah, between the two of them, I definitely got a lot of stuff. Um, you know, Motown was always big in our household. Um, mm-hmm. but obviously, you know, Bob Marley and Reggae and uh grew up listening to a lot of the deeper cuts and that stuff. So um, you know, it's something I'm thankful for now. I think it definitely, you know, still inspires me to this day, but I still you know, love that music so much. Like Motown and reggae are probably my two biggest, um, you know, early, early influences. And then, and then, so you started playing guitar at nine. What other, do you have other instruments you play? And then I guess, when did the, the kind of dance music stuff happen? I started playing guitar when I was nine and I actually hated it at first. Cause I think I was like, I think it was my teacher. I had a, you know, kind of like a stiff, older gentleman, you know, a guy who was like, oh, we're just going to start off. We're going to learn how to read music. You know, I'm like a nine, 10 year old kid. I mean, like the third grade. And I just wanted to like, you know, play a song. <laughs> <laughs> so like, like, um, like all nine year olds, they just want to pick it up and play like. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, um, I didn't stick with it long. I, um, I did it for maybe like a year, year and a half. And then I put it down, um, and I always, um, I always did musical theater too. So I was always like singing and, and, uh, I took voice classes and stuff like that. But then I didn't really do music for like a couple of years. I was kind of doing the sports stuff and I, I was still doing the acting stuff. But, um, I picked up the guitar again when I was 13 and that's when like tab, I, I they, they might've had them around obviously too before that, but I, I discovered tabs, um, on online and I could, mm-hmm. you know, read how to play a song that I liked on the computer. And so I was able to pick it up again and actually get into it and like teach myself stuff again. And that's when I really got serious with guitar. And, you know, I started taking um, classes with, with a guy out here who was at Berkeley. Um, Cause you know, we have Berkeley school of music here in Boston, which is a really famous conservatory music conservatory mm-hmm. um, in the States. Um, I think they've got a satellite location actually now in like Granada or something like that. Yeah, they've got one over here for sure. They've got, um, yeah. 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 But, um, but yeah, so I started doing that really seriously. Um, believe it or not, my dad never taught me how to play the piano, and that is my biggest uh, resentment towards him. <laughs> no way. No way. Yeah, I thought that would been like literally, like literally as soon as you could touch the keys, it had been getting you on there. No way. Yeah, you would think oh. so. But <laughs> unfortunately not. But I did, I did actually, um, I tried taking piano lessons when I was a little bit older, when I was like 14 or 15. And it's just like one of those things that it was so hard for me to pick up. I was also trying to learn how to like, I I know how to play the drums, but I wanted to take lessons. And that was kind of like a similar situation. I had like a very kind of strict, like jazz drummer teacher who like, you know, wanted me to hold the sticks right. And like, you know, (laughs) do everything right. I just wanted to like, yeah, let's go. Let's jam. (laughs) <laughs> so that didn't last long, but I, um, you know, so I do play a little bit of piano. I can play the drums. I can play the bass. Yeah. You know, most of his stuff is done, you know, on the MIDI keyboard now here. I don't really play the guitar that much. Um, I still have three in my room, but, um, yeah, so that, I guess, um, how did that get into like production and stuff is, um, you know, I was playing in bands, uh, almost as soon as I started playing like guitar again, when I was 13, 
Um, I started a band with one of my best friends at the time. He, um, you know, was, was singing and like writing a lot of songs, but you know, there was like, it was like green day and like blink One Eighty Two kind of style stuff. <laughs> uh, it was like yeah. pop punk. Yeah. Um, we, so we did that for a little while and, um, you know, we had a little band throughout middle school <clears throat> and high school and stuff. And then, um, you know, in high school I started to get my, um, you know, my, 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 my playing tastes started to expand and, you know, I was playing a little bit more, um, taste, like kind of stuff with a little bit more taste to it. You know, I was doing some, I had a band with a friend who was a really amazing singer songwriter kind of sounded like Jason Mraz or like, uh, meets John legend or something like that. Gavin DeGraw. So we were kind nice. of doing stuff like that. That was kind of a mix of like fusion rock and pop and, you know, a little bit of jazzy stuff. But, um, you know, I did that. And then I went to college um, I went to Syracuse University. Um, for anyone who knows what that is, <laughs> yeah, we got we got loads of US. You got loads of US in that. Who knows in that where that is in the chat? The orange, uh, yeah, <laughs> loads of them in the chat. Um, they have a good basketball team, so a lot of people like their basketball team. We're good at lacrosse. I think we won like the US women's hockey or women's soccer this year too, or something like that. So it's a big sports school, but um, I went there for acting at first. Um, oh, cool! And yeah, while I was there, I. Um, I started a band. I started my own ska band, but it was like ska experimental. You know, it was like Grateful Dead meets Bob Marley kind of stuff. Nice. <laughs> Smoking a lot of weed and <laughs> you know, just kind of noodle- noodling around and jamming and stuff. But, um, you know, it was a lot of fun, but it was a nine piece band. <laughs> we had four horns. It was crazy. And it was just a lot of, um, you know, it was a lot to handle. Um, so we kind of dwindled down to about six and then sometimes five. And, um, you know, at this same time I had my turntables, uh, with me in college because I actually learned how to DJ because of, uh, reggae and stuff like that too. Because when I was living in Boston as a 17, 18 year old kid, my, I was hanging out with my sister a lot, who's, um, three and a half years older than me. And I was going to the bars in, um, you know, Alston Brighton, where I was living at the time. And my friends, you know, I couldn't get in because I, you know, was 17, 18 years old. So my friends that were DJing would have me, you know, carry his equipment into the bar so that I could get in and they didn't (laughs) ask me questions. And then I just eventually would stand behind him and watch him DJ. And I just got, I've always been into, um, you know, obviously music, but I also um, love to like take things apart. I used to like take apart computers and I used to take apart like, um, I call it a clicker, but remote controls, <laughs> like for the yeah, TV. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I used to take those apart and put them back together and stuff like that. So, you know, I just have like a sort of mechanical mind. And when I see like, you know, these things spinning and I'm seeing him move these faders up and down, these knobs, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, what is all this stuff going on here? Um, you know, and I, I learned how to DJ. I got my own set of turntables. But I actually wasn't even beat matching then. I just, you know, was playing like dub records and, you know, kind mm. of like echoing out or like fading in and out. But yeah, I I would sometimes like take my PA system that I had with my turntables in college and just set up outside and play music, um, you know, for all the kids in the dorms. And like as a freshman, that's, you know, you would have, you would have uh, someone with like a nice stereo in their room, but it was pretty rare that some kid had like a full, you know, sound system turntables records and stuff like that so um that i remember the exact gig it was like you know the summer of my freshman year or the you know towards the end of the year for freshman year and i'm playing music outside and people come you know start coming up to me and they're like oh like would you play at our, our party would you play at our you know our, our frat semi-formal or whatever and i'm like yeah you know here's my email hit me up and um you know i started getting a couple gigs doing that stuff and then I was getting into dance music at that time as well. Um, you know, I'd, I had um, been exposed to some earlier stuff like the Prodigy and the Chemical Brothers and Daft mm-hmm. Punk, um, kind of because of stuff my sister was listening to at that time. She was a little bit more into like the industrial stuff. You know, she used to listen to like Rob Zombie and Marilyn Manson and Korn and that sort of stuff. But, you know, some of the other like the stuff I just mentioned that kind of would sneak its way in there. And so I was familiar with that, but then uh, Justice came out with their album Cross, um, yep. and that kind of got me hooked into I dance music. Ugh, such a good. I still like sometimes when I'm driving, you know, I like to listen to full albums, 
and I'll yeah. put that one on and just listen to the whole thing. That's cool. I wanted I wanted to talk about albums later. But that's yeah, I love that album. Um, I actually, I'm one of my my running album is their woman. You know, their woman. Uh, they're kind of oh, their, yeah. The their woman one, which is basically like the Daft Punk, where Daft Punk did their live version, but they did the similar. And I run right. to that because it's got it's got kind of ups and speeds and downs and speeds and oh, yeah. like it makes me faster basically every time I run it. <laughs> <laughs> and it has little it has little slow bits where I just sort of slow give yourself a little bit of a breather and then and then right. it goes faster again you know and then you pick up the pace and you're like oh pick up the pace again come on up the hill yeah um, got that nice natural rhythm to it that's actually you yeah know, something that yeah. I think um, you know I just want to point that out well we can talk about it later and um, you know get deeper into it but that is something that was like massively important to me on this album for me. So, you know, like listening to the way an album flows together. Um, I was, I was, I was studying that for like, you know, the last couple of years while I was putting my thing mm-hmm. together. So that's, you know, finding a good album that flows together like that and has its own natural rhythm is super special. I think. It's funny. You mentioned that, that album, the justice album and the kind of chemical problems. So I, when I was listening to this earlier, one of my favorite albums is exit planet dust and oh, I yeah. love the fact that I love that album because it because it does that because it's got fast moments, got slow moments. And I was listening to this album earlier, and I um your album earlier, and I was like, you have it has that similar kind of thing. And I, I definitely want to talk about it in a bit. So that's cool. what, you know, yeah. When you said that album, I was like, that's why it does that. I could I I know one I've listened to because I've listened to yours, and I <laughs> I, I, I could I, I know why it does that now because you've got because you reference that that Justice, right. that Justice album. It's fun, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, were, so, de- so all these kind of DJing and these kind of frat parties. Like, I was trying to work out what year this was all happening because I, like, yeah. from just the stuff you were saying, like, you had emails, so it must be kind of like late nineties, early two thousands, maybe that sort of space. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is like, um, so I started learning how to DJ in like two thousand five, two thousand six. Um, yeah. I started college in two thousand seven. But yeah, cool. so I was like, you know, I was learning, I was learning at the bar and then I would actually like go to, um, garage, uh, garage center, guitar center, uh, you know, which is our big music, uh, store out here and they would have CDJs set up and I would just sit there for hours. You know, I would go in and I'd play guitar I'd play on their little rolling V drums and I would just, mm-hmm. you know, go in there and be a menace to these, to these workers for like three hours. Cause I'm just, you know, jamming on every single piece of equipment they have. <laughs> but, um, uh, but cool. yeah, so that was like. You know, I, I, we would have like snow days from school and I used to take the train in, uh, to school to, cause I went to school into the city of Boston, but yeah, you know, I, instead of going home after like, you know, they'd call it an early day, I'd go to guitar center and, you know, spend a couple extra hours there learning the equipment and stuff. But, um, but yeah, so then when cross cross came out, it was like 2006, 2007, that was my freshman year of college. So that was really like, you know, a lot of stuff was kind of happening. I had a lot of my own freedom. I was going to parties. You know, I started to, at the parties, I was like, <laughs> I would be, be a little bit of a snob. I'd be like, I hate this music. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here. And that's, you know, that's when I was like, you know, that's the kind of what's didn't start me to like start to like, you know, they didn't make me start the band, but it was one of the things that, uh, you know, I was just like, I need my music. I need, I need to, you know, hear the stuff that I want to hear. And, um, yeah, that, that eventually led me to starting a band and then the band falling apart. <laughs> and like, you know, trying to deal with people's schedules and also realizing that I didn't have to, you know, split when I did a DJ gig, I didn't have to split that 200 bucks that I made <laughs> with five other people. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that was definitely, um, uh, attractive, um, you know, aspect to it as well. But, um, yeah, kind of like all flowed naturally, but yeah, that was over, uh, 2007 is when I started school and I graduated 2011. So. Nicola, Nicolas, Nicolas, welcome in, dude. Uh, he says his wife was part of those Syracuse dance parties. She said they were, yes. she said they were amazing. Oh, yes. <laughs> yep. That, um, that my friend Allie, she, uh, she lived next door to us. And, uh, I used to, you know, we used to get in trouble sometimes like with our house because, uh, you know, we did so many parties and, you know, so it started off, uh, you know, we, so in our, in our dorms freshman year, you know, we would, we would blast it out. Like I said, I would bring the speakers out. And then the next year, uh, we lived on, we lived still technically like campus housing, but it was mm-hmm. called South campus. And what we did is we, um, you know, we got a bunch of our friends so that we had basically like, they were in blocks of four apartments in one building. 
So we had uh, three of us in one block, and then we became friends with the fourth one. But we would do whole like building parties, you know, where I'd be in our apartment DJing, and uh, you know, my film buddies would up- be upstairs. I was kind of like the smoking lounge, and then there was like a bar in our one friend's apartment, and um, you know, I remember the the student or the campus police showed up at one time and they were like, what are you guys trying to break some sort of record? (laughs) And, uh, you know, that, that led to us getting uh, our own house, but it was the same situation. We had like, um, you know, it was three apartments on each side. So there's six apartments in the building. We had five of them and, you know, I would just go into the, go into the basement on Friday and, you know, start playing music and we'd come out, you know, maybe sometime on Sunday. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. That's but yeah, cool. we had to, you know, we had to start, um, you know, we were, we were getting hot and we had to find other places and we make, became really good friends with, um, you know, our neighbors, um, Allie, who, who Eric was actually just talking, it's Eric Nicholas is his name, but, um, that's her husband now I actually played their wedding too. So nice What's up, guys. <laughs> welcome in. Welcome in. Yeah. Um, and then let's, let's, let's play some music, right? Let's start playing some I'm just conscious of time. We want to get through nine tracks. Right, let's start playing some music. So this, uh, we, let's talk about the album. Um, we'll get back into the, kind of the history in a minute. Let's let's talk about the album. Cool. So this was a 10-year process to create this album. Um, can we just talk about how it started, the ideas around it, and kind of what, you know, when you got that moment and thought, I'm going to make an album? Yeah, of course. The um, It was a 10-year process, but it was not an intentional 10-year process. So... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, I've talked about it a lot, but um, I um, I worked with Felix the House Cat for a while. Well, I still do, but um, you know that nice. was kind of like my big, my first kind of you know big break, I guess if you could say. That was like you know he was he was a big um, big factor in my career and just you know a big milestone for me. I, I worked on his uh, well, I, was, I started as his tour manager, but um, I and this is like 2011 as well. So I started tour managing for him and then he found out that I did production and, um, you know, he was telling me that he was wanting to make a new album and all this stuff. And, um, you know, all that eventually came into fruition and he, and he asked me to get involved with it. It was actually during one of those sessions we lived, he brought me out to Ibiza to uh, live with him during, during the summer because he was doing a residency at space at the time. Um, and so we also, he was, uh, on, he had a show on Abusa Sonica as well. So we would, we had a, quite the, uh, it was a Friday night. We had a great little Friday night regimen. We would go do Abusa Sonica. Then we would go eat at, uh, you know, the Island. So there's this place called Camp Pilo. Um, yeah. it's, you know it? Yeah. The meat place. Yeah. Oh, so good. I can it's still lush. like taste it. Oh, so good. They have these like they have these like sauteed mushrooms, which I still try to recreate to these day. That's just so good. But anyways. Nice. <laughs> nice. I, I love to, yeah, I love to eat. So um I make a lot of a food analogies and I'll talk about food a lot, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but, down um, for that. That's all, that's cool. Perfect. Um but yeah, so <laughs> we would um we would do that. We would go go eat and then we'd go back to the house and relax for a little bit, and then we'd go out to space and Felix would play his residency. And then we'd go to music on afterwards and see Marco until, Sick. you know, 10, 11 in the morning. And then we'd go back home and sleep for a day. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, because we were partying and stuff, you know, Felix is a little bit older than me. Um, you know, sometimes he would like kind of take a little bit longer to bounce back to recover. So, you know, I'd go into the studio and I'd start messing around and I, um, you know, would make my own tracks or I, I would try to make stuff to see if he wanted to use it. Um, you know, just like start an idea and be like, Hey, do you think this would work for you? You know? And, um, the, the, so the first song that I, I, I made that I, I wanted Felix to take, um, was risky business. And, um, yeah, so that one was, that was written for the first time. It was 2013. We were in a visa and I actually still have the, uh, like the video that I took from, like, you know, when I first made the idea and I'm like panning, you look out the window and it's like, you know, the world's worst camera. It looks like, you know, it's all <laughs> and stuff. 
But nice. um, yeah, it was really cool to kind of go back and look at that. And I still have the project session. I have a, I have a, I have a session with Felix's vocals on it with like some scratch vocals that he did that obviously I've never put out. But, um, you know, I had, I had like his, he was just kind of like, you know, humming, like doing some, you know, melody stuff, but there, there weren't words. So I, when I first started passing that song around to people looking for vocals, I had his vocals on it as like an idea, as a reference. So, so yeah, that was the first, um, you know, that was the first project that I made for the album. Obviously didn't know that it was going to be an album at that time, but so I, um, you know, that song was really special. It's, you know, it's kind of like a deep house and, you know, you remember 2013 at all. That was kind of like the brink of when like MK was kind of coming back around and like hot, hot creations. creations. Was, yeah. Hot creations. Was just, exactly. Just about, yeah. Yeah. I remember yep. it well. Yeah. So it has that really like sort of deep house, like Balearic sort of sound. Um, and I think you can really, you know, if you probably, especially to, you know, once, like once you hear that, I think that a lot more people like get that song now, but, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I was really influenced by like that deep house stuff, that stuff that I was hearing in Ibiza. Um, and I just wanted to kind of make something that I like what I was hearing at the time. So yeah, I just, I sat on it and I knew, I knew from the time I started it that I wanted to, uh, you know, finish it, but I just sat around for a while and, um, kind of the same thing with a, a bunch of the songs. Do you was one of those that I did 2014, um, recorded the vocals for the first time back then. And I just, that one was such a crazy song because I had this idea that was based off of John Hopkins collider, the music video. Um, it's this woman like running around, um, a warehouse and it's kind of like flashing back to when she was there for a party and a rave and she's being like thrown around. And, um, you know, my idea for the song was to basically like embody this girl and get into her head and see like, you know, the things that she was taught, like just talking to herself and she's like, Oh, I can't find my friends. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh no, I'm thirsty. Oh, where's the bathroom? Oh, like I'm happy now because you know, I'm crying. And it's so just like, there's this inner, um, struggle. There's this inner dialogue that, 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 you know, you can hear in the song, but, um, there were so many vocals that I like didn't really know what to do with the song at first. Cause it was just like such a daunting thing to try to edit. Um, and a similar story with the, you know, the Lee, Lee Perry stuff, like, you know, that the Lee Perry thing I did with him, um, he actually recorded those vocals that are on love reach. He recorded that for risky business in 2016 Um, I was going to do a project with my buddy, David Marston, who's a Jamaican guy as well. But, um, he, uh, we didn't end up using the vocals for that project. I sat on it for so long. And then, um, you know, it was during the pandemic actually that I decided I wanted to do the album because I had, um, I'd been sending some stuff to Dorley for his label Mm -hmm. and I wanted to, you know, do a release. So I was sending him a bunch of ideas and he liked, um, the track move again. And he was like, this is a cool one, but, um, you know, I, I want to put it on a compilation. And I was like, you know, like and that, that I was down to do it. Um, you know, I was doing, a, I'd done a couple compilations at the time already. I was just trying to really, you know, kind of build my career up and I really wanted to do an EP. So I told mm-hmm. him, I was like, Hey, you know, I'll give you another track for a compilation, but this song in particular is kind of special to me and I want to do an EP with it. And then right after that is when the pandemic happened and, you know, I kind of got depressed and didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And, um, you know, I, that's when I wrote brighter day and, um, you know, it was kind of using that to help lift me out of like my own funk and, you know, just try to write something that was pretty and happy and just, um, you know, tried to get, tried to make me remember why I do what I do and why I make music. So, Mm -hmm. um, after I finished that, you know, my dad played piano on that and stuff. That was a really special record to make. Um, and it was during the process of writing that song when I realized like I, I had a larger body of work that could go together. And so I was like, cool, I have this brighter day song. I have this move again song. These would work really well together. I thought I was just going to do an EP. And then I started going back and listening to the tracks like risky business and do you and cross the line was another one. That actually uh, started as a collab with Antler Rock, who mm-hmm. was a good friend of mine. A good, you know, we've collaborated a couple of times yeah. before. Yeah, you guys have had him, uh, you know, on uh, some of the on data transitions. Stuff. Stuff. Yeah, on a load of stuff. He's cool. Okay, so let's listen. Let's start with Risky Business. Perfect.
we go, gang. How is that? Love that. So nice. Let me just go back to this mode. So nice. You can definitely hear their deep house. Like I was just saying, off thing, it's like, I love that sound. I love the kind of that, like, Hot Creations, Alexis Raphael, Jamie Jones, all that kind of sound from that sort of space. Oh, my word. So good. Who are the vocalists? Tell me about those. They're cool. Yeah. So, um, Hundred Thousands is my buddy Zach. Um, his name's Zach Britt. He actually has a really cool. So, Hundred Thousands is his solo project. Um, and he has some really good tunes. Um, it's a little bit more, it's kind of like um, electronic folk almost. It's got like um like a Fleet Foxes sort of vibe to it, but it's also like sort of dancey and like indie. It's really cool, interesting stuff. Um, but he has another project which you actually might be familiar with. I'm, I can't remember if you've done any premieres or anything with them yet, but um he, they've got like a cool little indie disco group called Super Taste. No, but I want to hear this. This sounds. This is definitely up my street. Okay, I'll, I'm going to send it to you because yeah, that's so it's him and this other guy. I think you might know Slugfather. Does that name sound familiar? I do know that person. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's his partner. So Super Taste is Slugfather and Hundred Thousands. They're both really good buddies of mine. Um, and I actually did a remix for them um, when they first started their project. And um, you know, I'd, I'd actually been working with Zach during the pandemic. Not something I fully want to admit, but uh, there was a big, giant virtual festival that never took place during um, during the pandemic. It was called well, it was called two different things. It was called uh, Electric Boogaloo, B- uh, Electric Blockaloo at first, and then they changed the name to uh, Blockfest, and it was nice. supposed to be um, a big music festival in Minecraft. Some of you guys might remember this. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, it was like a thousand never, artists. Didn't ever happen. It was, oh, that's no, funny. well, so the technology failed on it. Um, and it had, mm-hmm. so I was, so me and Zach were basically the only two artist um, coordinators for the whole thing. We, our, our boss was, um, you know, she's a great lady. Um, she works in tech, but she loves music. And, um, you know, just like had this really cool idea to do a music festival in Minecraft and, um, you know, if, if we had done it the way we said we were supposed to do it, it would have worked out well. But um, <laughs> we just took on, you know, got way too ambitious. She just kept adding stages, adding artists. And um, and by the time the festival was ready to take place, the technology side wasn't ready. Like they didn't, they didn't build everything they needed to build, um, you know, in terms of like the coding and stuff. So it didn't happen the way we had, had marketed it. And, you know, for people coming from the tech world, they were like, oh, well, it's fine. You know, it's like, a proof of concept, you know, like when in the tech world, you know, when you deliver a product and it doesn't do all the things you say it's going to do, people get it, you know, it's fine. They're not going to be upset. And I was like, well, this is not the tech world. This is the music space. This is the event space. And when you tell people that you have an event, if it doesn't happen at the date and time and with the people you say it's going to happen with, then you are screwed. (laughs) You know, people are going (laughs) to come after you. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was cool. But anyway, so Zach and I have always been friends, but we really reconnected during that, that while we were working on that. And, you know, we were talking every single day for hours every day um, about this project. And then, um, you know, when the thing ultimately failed and, and we kind of took a step back, um, both Zach and I, I spent about four months off the internet. I couldn't, I was, I was online all day long for working on that event. So when it, when it failed, it was kind of a big bummer and I took a step back. But, um, you know, Zach and I were like, hey, let's do some music together now that we have all this free time that we're not working. Yeah, I had sent him this, um, I had sent him the instrumental for Risky Business. And he's like, oh yeah, this is really cool. I think I can put some stuff together. He sent me like the first verse that he did. And, um, you know, we had changed it, went back and forth a little bit. And then, um, you know, at first I just had the verses and I wasn't going to do like a chorus, but, um, you know, I've been, I've been sitting to it, listening for so long. I was like, man, like it just needs something else, needs something else. And, um, he had tried a couple different things going back and forth, like I said, and then, um, you know, I finally nailed it and, uh, gave me the chorus that's in there now. So, um, yeah, it was really fun to work with him. It was, you know, something I've been wanting to do for a couple of years and I think it turned out great. That's cool. Mark one said he would smash that in the car. With, with, smash that in the car when with the car with the windows open. You know that Hulk smash it in the car with the windows open. Oh uh, yes. 
Uh, right, let's let's play let's play a second track because I'm conscious we have got nine track gang. We have done our all time newest world. Re- we, we do you know we we uh, we tried to listen to Sunny Federa's album once on this uh, on on the stream in two hours, wow. and again it was about eight or nine out tracks, and we got through I think like three in an hour. Someone will tell me. Someone will tell me wrong. Someone will tell me. It was it was jokes basically things we had a phone that kept beeping yeah four at most and it was so we're like we're we're nearly at two we're nearly we're nearly an hour in we've got one track so oh let's get God. another tr- let's <laughs> let's get another track uh, yes. and kind of uh, let's st- let's start with the first track let's start let's start yep. uh, still in love tell me about this one quickly so this one's actually really fun um, and so there's a whole concept and a whole story to this album. It's partly true, but also kind of um, embellished. And it's like, it's supposed to be sort of like a Requiem for a Dream meets Alice in Wonderland. It's sort of like a dark, it's like a dark love story that isn't a love story. It's kind of like a, yeah, it's kind of like a, it's, it's, it's kind of about heartbreak, but um, it's also got like this psychedelic sort of vibe to it as well. It's like another realm sort of vibe. It's like you kind of go someplace else. Um, but so this, um, still in love was a track that I put out in 2013 and, um, it was basically me, you know, at the time when I had, I'd broken up with like my college girlfriend and was sad. It's actually a song to yourself. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people think it's supposed to be like a love song to someone else, but it's like, you know, the idea that when you're upset and you think that, that someone doesn't want you, you know, just to remember to love yourself. To, to you know be be your own biggest fan to to you know try to find your own self-worth again and stuff like that so it's kind of like you know it's similar to what brighter days is too brighter days has that same vibe but yeah so um i redid the song um the original song has this like really kind of poppy piano but i wanted to just do an update and i wanted to start the album there because that's kind of like where the story starts it kind of you know takes play it, it 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 sets it starts off um you know at that at that time it was like 2013 and stuff you know and like I said like that's when I started making the album and stuff so it just it it, it felt like the right song to start the album with. Let's play this then. There we go. So yeah, like I said, that was a song I did a long time ago. I mean, I, I made the first version in like 2012, um, put it out in 2013, and mm-hmm. um, actually did like a whole music video for it. And um, it was the music video was premiered on Complex, which is cool too because on this album they did um, they did a premiere for the Love Reach record as well. So that was cool, nice little full circle. And then let's chat. Let's. You mentioned you started DJing. Let's chat. Radioactive parties. Late. Is that the, they started first and the label came after? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so we started Radioactive in 2012, um, and nice. we just started the label this past year in, in 2022. We actually did not want to start. Well, I didn't want to start a label as Radioactive. I just wanted it to be an event series. Everyone thought we were a label already. Everyone told us to do it. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, so we had mentioned that you and I have been talking for a while. And one of the reasons why that is, is because I've been working for different record labels for years. And, you know, I've been a label manager um, for a couple different labels. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. Um, and not always the most amount of return or reward. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, we had been, we had done, a, you know, we had been doing well with events. Um, you know, everything was going well. I was like, you know, why, why mess with a good thing? <laughs> kind yeah, of thing. yeah. Yeah. I was like, you know, like once you become a label, it's just something else. And I just wanted to be, you know, a kind of different 
kind of platform. I don't know why, honestly, just, it was just, there was no real reason behind it. Um, we just wanted to do events for a while, but yeah. So, um, with the 10 year anniversary, you know, we had, we had another friend who, um, who also did some like label management for other stuff. Um, he also worked for native instruments and Metapop. I worked for native instruments as well. So some of our um, other network people that we work with is, you know, kind of come in through that and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, so he, um, uh, reached out to me and one of my other partners, James, um, this kid, Ben, he was like, Hey, why don't you guys start a label? You know, I've got some free time. If you want me to help you manage it, I can do that. And, um, yeah, Ben helped us like get everything up and running. And, um, we decided what, what basically our goal for the first year was to, um, just put out compilations. Um, you know, it's always been a big, an important thing for me to put on new artists and to put on people that I know personally, you know, it's kind of like that aspect of community and growing together and, you know, kind of like finding your tribe, um, finding where you belong. I think that like one thing in life and also just, you know, with music is like people are constantly looking for acceptance and finding a place where they belong. And radioactive is, was kind of just meant to be like a place where anyone can kind of fit in. You know, we kind of have our style, we have our tastes, you know, it's the kind of idea where it's, it's for, it's, it's, everyone is welcome, but it's not for everyone. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's that yeah. kind of aspect. It's like, you know, if people want to, if people come and they like it and they vibe with it, then, you know, awesome. If not cool, we'll see you later. Um, type thing, cool. you know? Yeah. And it's, um, you know, that's kind of what we what we really wanted to do with the compilations is just really kind of, you know, similar to what I do with the album is like, you know, I have all these tastes, I have all these, you know, kind of different things that inspire me. And I wanted to present them all in one place because I think like, when you're like, oh, here it is all together. You know, it's just a lot more cohesive and people can understand something, um, you know, all at once rather than these fragmented pieces of all these different things. Cause when it's all different stuff, you know, spread out, people are like, Oh, well I don't see the connection here. You know, I don't understand how it, how this song can relate to this song or how, you know, this, how you could play this song and then also play this song and stuff like that, you know? So doing the compilations were really important. Um, you know, we wanted to put on our community. We wanted to put on um, our friends and yeah, we put out, Four compilations last year, uh, fifty nine tracks in total. Yeah, it was friggin' insane. <laughs> how how, how were, they, were they quart quarterly then? Were they? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so we did. Um, yeah, one one compilation every quarter, and then uh, you know I decided I was like, okay, well I'm gonna put out my album next. Uh, that's gonna be the next big project, and that's you know where we are now. This was our first um, sort of like single artist release. And, um, you know, it's funny, I, I mentioned that we didn't want to um, start a label. And I actually had been prepping to launch a different label. Um, I have another brand that I've been working on, and I'll give you guys a little sneak peek of it. It's called Adult Daycare Records. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you know, sort of the idea of like, you know, all my background as a tour manager and a label manager and artist manager and stuff. It's like, you know, this idea that I'm always like taking care of you know, people who are, you know, almost double my elders or, or something, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just supposed to be super fun. Um, sort of like, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, movement in Detroit, but Seth Troxler has a party that he does. That's just like super fun. It's on Monday. Uh, you know, everyone, it's like, he's running the door. People are silly. It's supposed to be that sort of vibe, you know, it was like not, nice. not super serious. It's like, you know, it's like stepping in our, it's like stepping in our disco shed. It's a, it's a little bit, yes, a little bit, exactly, a little bit, exactly, a little bit crazy. Yes, it's a little bit crazy, a little bit fun, but you know, always good vibes, always you know. But yeah, so it sounds, sounds so definitely up our street. It sounds, it sounds definitely up in our street in here, doesn't it, gang? <laughs> sounds, like, like gang in the chat, you want to hear this music, don't you? Like, like it sounds yeah. like so it definitely sounds like a place we all want to go. Like from our street, absolutely. To, to- yeah, I like I my my <laughs> ideal spot to throw a party with that label would be like Pikes, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, I was there. I was there at Pikes last week. It was good. It was good fun. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm hoping. I'm hope. I hope to go to Pikes while I'm out there for Orbit this year. Dude, we should. De- we'll definitely go. We'll definitely go. Right. You, we'll, we'll. Yeah, we'll sneak off one evening and go to Pikes. That's, <laughs> that's, that's definite. We're definitely doing that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm gonna put it in the calendar. <laughs> we'll, <just do> it. <laughs> well up for that, dude. Let's do that. But yeah, but um, um, yeah, so that's, uh, we obviously put that brand on hold and 
not really doing that right now, but um, you know, we're we're going full force with radioactive. Um, we've got a couple more things on the horizon. Um, basically, you know, I've I have three other partners that are part of radioactive. It's myself, uh, my partner Pierce, who goes by some kind, uh, James, who I mentioned is James Ellington. And then yep. um, Will O.B. is another one of our artists who I believe you are familiar with, too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all really great guys. Um, so our next release is by a guy named Schrodes. Really great. Nice. Um, also sort of disco-ish yeah, producer. But then um, and then we're going to focus on our other partners um, are all going to do like their projects. Will has an EP that he's doing. James is working on an EP and Pierce is working on an EP. Um you know, we want to, like I said earlier, just like pushing each other forward and pushing people in our community is really forward. But, you know, we do so much stuff behind the scenes. We don't always put ourselves on every party. Um, you know, we want to kind of take a moment to really like give ourselves a proper introduction to the world and, mm-hmm. and kind of let everyone know who we are in the process of, you know, still putting out other people's music and stuff as well. That's cool. And the parties, still, parties are still happening? Like Saturdays are still regular? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. We, um, we, you know, Miami music week is a really big thing for us. Uh, we I remember, I remember we did, we, 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 we were partnered on one a, a few years ago. Uh, oh, that's right. Yes. Yes. You, you were like our official media. Yes. Oh my God. I remember this. Yeah. And that ended up, <laughs> that ended up kind of getting messed up too, because of the, the stream, we were supposed to be like doing a bunch of streams with you. And I think we did like the first one and then mm. the internet got all messed up and it was, it was a yeah. disaster, but, um, those parties went really well. So, um, but yeah, we've been doing Miami for 10 years. And, uh, so what you're talking about, we uh, took over a rooftop for the week. Um, it was the townhouse hotel. We took over the rooftop. We called it the radioactive rooftop. Um, yeah, we did, um, the first party on Wednesday, it was, um, it was option four's party. I forget what brand he had, but it was him and, um, Will Clark did a, a party together. We had that's like right. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There was a, there were, the lineups were sick. Yep. I forgot Will Clark was on that. Yeah. 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 Yep. That was cool. Yeah. The Thursday, I can't remember. Oh, the Thursday one was um, it was Psycho Disco. That was super cool. We had like Todd Terry, DJ Pierre. Nice. Friday was ours. We had that Friday was the craziest one. We had Felix the House Cat. We had Soul Clap. We had Miha. We had That's Dombreski right. before he was Dombreski. He played with my friend Codes, who I was managing That's at the right. time. Uh, that party was so crazy. They like had a line going down. So like, you know, you know, if you've ever been to South Beach, you know, it's, it's kind of on a grid. You know, it goes mm-hmm. up to, um, well, like South Beach itself kind of goes up to like the 20s or something. But we were on 20th. And when you go out to 20th, then it's, um, uh, what is that from there? Collins. And there was a there was a line going out the hotel down twentieth and then back around the corner on Collins, so it was nice. insane. Yeah, and it was a free party too. Like that was that is something that's <laughs> always really important to us for Miami Music Week is to do free events because you know you you hear about people showing up to space and paying eight hundred dollars to get into space. They're you know they're they're buying tables at Live or store or wherever you know, and it's just like. Hmm. there's people are just spending so much money and um you know we we wanted to give people an alternative because you know we're a bunch of broke kids we can't afford to get into any of those places so we (laughs) wanted to give you know people like us a place where they could go and you know still have fun and still hear really really good music um and you know luckily like my i think um, you know, not to toot my own horn a little bit, but it, it's kind of a unique situation that we're in because of all the stuff that I've done with like label managing and tour managing. Um, you know, all the, all the relationships that I've been able to build over the years have allowed us to do those parties because, you know, all those artists that we're working with are taking such a small fee, um, mm. if any fee at all too, for some of those, you know, like people like Felix used to do a lot of those parties for free. Um, you know, nice. and, um, helped us really, you know, we, yeah, we had a lot of really amazing artists, um, that, you know, kind of just believed in what we were doing and believed in us and would, you know, do favors for us like that and allow us to build the community that we've built. That's cool. Okay. Let's play another track. Let's play brighter yes. days. You mentioned about it before, but let's, let's play it and then we'll chat. Let's play it and then we'll chat after. Sometimes I get caught up
go, gang. That was sick. Love that. So your awesome. dad played, you. played the piano on that, did he? Yes. Yeah. So um, this was a fun one, too. So I actually just uh, did like this thing. It was like a three essential tunes, you know, like another interview thing. And um, hmm. one of the songs that I picked was the inspiration for this song. So it's by Soul Clap and Pillow Talk with Greg Paulus. And then it just says featuring Crew Love. Which is basically, you know, like they're all their best friends and stuff. They all just work together and play on each other's <laughs> records. And, you know, I was just talking about that and how important that is to me. So, you know, just already that, um, you know, that kind of mentality and philosophy is is super fun and, and just, you know, what I, um, you know, what I believe in and stuff. So, yeah, that song was inspired by a song called Love Train, which is just like super fun. It's got like this old school, um, you know, kind of happy, skippy beat to it. And it's got this really pretty piano line in it. And, you know, I just had been listening to that song for over and over and over again. And, um, you know, I just decided I wanted to do something like that um, to kind of be happy and bright because, you know, we were all sad and inside and not doing anything. So, um, yeah, you know, I had... um, don't really want to say this like 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 uh you know straight up but i kind of copied the song you know like I would, I would, <laughs> nice. yeah sitting there you know and with my ableton and i you know i pulled it in I, that was my reference and i was like oh you know i want to do something like this and it obviously changed and you know became what it was but um mm-hmm. yeah i mean i think you know a lot of people have have references have songs and stuff and that's fine for anyone who's listening there that doesn't make music yet or you know is making music it's fine to have a reference it's fine to you know, try to try to sound like other people now and then, but make sure you pull it back and put your own spin on it. Don't copy people. It's a slow clap love train. On our, so on our demo it. streams, on our, on our demo streams on a Monday, we're literally constantly telling people to go get a reference tracking because they're, yep. especially things like, yep. especially things like arrangement, like get, use the uh, reference together, right? I still, I, I mean, I, I like, I'll hear a, set, a track. I mean, nowadays it's like, you know, I can do the arrangement any, anyways, but like, you know, you might hear a really interesting arrangement. You might hear something really cool and you're like, oh, well, that's just, I didn't do it like that. You know, I'm like, won't get too far on this, but one of my favorite things to do, uh, you know, for anyone in the production world is like, you know, I'll take, I'll take a track, put it in my Ableton and I'll just quickly chop up the track. So I see how it plays out, you know? So it's like, oh, well, there's a 16 bar intro. So I cut the, you know, I just make little markers for myself and then I add little, um, you know, notes in um with the locators and i'll say oh you know kick and clap come in or chords and lead or whatever you know whatever happens there i just put that so that i see you know how the song kind of progresses and that just helps me you know it's like a practice thing um you know it helps me think about when i want to bring things in or bring things out or how to bring things in and it's like you know sometimes i think with uh you know production some people are like oh well i can only you know, introduce one thing at a time, but it's like, you know, no, like, you know, bring three things in at once or bring two things away, you know, just these different things where it's just like getting your, getting your mind into that mentality and understanding how other people do it, help you so much, you know, so much. And then, uh, where are we up to? Let me go. I just lost my page. Um, so, and obviously you mentioned earlier that track came off of the back of being at home and depression and i guess that was from touring i guess you were touring all the time and being a tour manager and then all of a sudden it stopped and that must have been tough yeah yeah and actually um so in uh at the end of 2017 i decided to stop tour managing i was working with um nicole madaber i was her um you know north and south american tour manager so i did everything north and south america and i did uh, i had another kid that i was working with actually kova was in here earlier kova and i worked with um I still work with this kid. His name's Gromo. He's um, just turned like 24, 25, I forget. Uh, really amazing, amazing producer. Um, he's kind of been, um, you know, dabbling in different stuff. He started with like kind of EDM, bass house kind of stuff. Um, and then was really into like hip hop, made a whole like old school hip hop album that he couldn't get cleared and kind of went back no to way. the drawing board. Yeah. And he <laughs> made this, he has this, I'll send it to you, but um he is he is in the process of finishing up. It's like an EP, but maybe an album. And it's really interesting music. It's sort of like bassy, housey. Um, you know, it's kind of kind of like Skrillex inspired, kind of like Fred again inspired and stuff like that. Fortet, what those guys are doing. 
Um, but it's not, it's, it's, it's different enough like that. I don't know how to describe it, but it's really interesting, really cool stuff. Yeah. So anyways, I uh, was working with a bunch of people and, um, and after 2000, I also used to do Wolfgang Gartner. Yeah. Felix, like I said, Matador, all different kind of people. But yeah, so I stopped doing all of that. And then 2018 and 19, I just solely focused on trying to be an artist myself. And, um, you know, I'd always been doing that, obviously, but I was like on the sides. I was, you know, I was managing people too. And it was like, you know, I'd get a, I'd get an offer to play a festival. Like I got an offer to play at um, Electric Forest that I ultimately didn't take, which is a huge festival here. Um, but I didn't take it because I had a conflict already. I had a, we have, um, we do a lot of boat parties in New York and that's like our big, bread and butter part kind of parties. Um, and we had a boat party, which I probably would have skipped, but, um, I got an, yeah, I got an offer to play on the, this ain't Bristol stage. And, um, you know, an artist that I was managing at the time codes, you know, he had a release on this in Bristol. So I was like, Oh, you know what? Like, why don't I just give it to you? And, uh, you know, I, I'd still do stuff like that, but, you know, at this time, that's like, you know, like I'm saying 2018, 2019, that's when I decided like, you know, you know what, I'm going to really put myself out there. I'm going to take these opportunities so, you know, when 2020 rolls around, I actually had just announced like a 30 date tour between March and May that I literally, so um, I think we shut down here March 13th or something like that. Yeah, I went out and so the fr- I went and played the first show on this tour. It was at Spy Bar in Chicago. So I went to Spy Bar, um, played the show, which I didn't know if it was going to happen or not. I, I remember being in, in Chicago, like some places have, had closed down already. I remember like trying to go find a place to eat. And um, yeah, went and played the show. It was all good. Luckily, like I after party till like 7 a.m. because that was the last party I did for two years. <laughs> so, oh, you know, fuck. the most out of it. But um, but yeah, so like that, it was just a really big bummer. You know, I had, I had been, I was really lost. Um, you know, I had all this momentum. I felt like things were on the up. Um, you know, I was actually chatting with a management company as well about getting brought on by a management company. And yeah, then um, the pandemic happened and my whole life got turned up upside down. Obviously, didn't have any of those shows happening. The management that stuff sucks. went away. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a big bummer. So, um, you know, I just decided, you know, to put that my energy into the music and, um, yeah, like I said, like once I made this record, once I made brighter day, that that's what set it off for me. That's when I got hooked and I was like, I'm going to make an album and you know, that it helped, it helped bring me out of the funk and it helped bring me, you know, even out of uh, like a deeper funk that I think I didn't even know I was in, you know, with production and stuff too, because, um, you know, something I've been talking about for a while now, like, so I I used to have another project um, for a couple of years called Chemicals of Creation. That was a little bit more uh, like at the time we were, we called it tropical bass. I don't know if you remember this phase of music. No, no. It was like right before Moonbaton. It was like right before Moonbaton got popular. Um, Oh no. It was like, it was like some of the stuff that like Crookers was doing and like Sandro Silva, you know, it was kind of like on the outskirts of like Fidget House. Um, I like Fiji House. Tropical yeah, I love, I love that. Was like all that kind of stuff is what I was doing. But then there was like, yeah, it was like, um, so uh, there was a group, some like Brazilian stuff too. You know, a lot of that, like the tropical bass stuff was just like Baile Funk that we didn't really understand what it was. So like Baraka Som Sistema was one of the groups. That, oh, yeah, that yeah, yeah. Out, I love like that. Bon, bon, bon um, <laughs> another group that kind of reminds, reminds me of that stuff. But or like MIA, even like some of her stuff. You know, that early stuff that Diplo was doing, like that was kind of tropical, tropical bass or whatever, or global bass, people were calling it for a little while too. Right after that, like trap became really popular and we did trap for a while and that just got played out really fast. And I really started liking Moombatone a little bit and that got played out. And like, you know, so just basically all of these, all of these things that I liked that were super trendy just became like super, you know, trendy internet genres and got blown up and got, um, you know, kind of bastardized really fastly and like stuff just became kind of paint by number of music where everyone was sounding the same. Everyone had that same like pitched up lead like, and um, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, pitch bend lead. And um, I had this, this is when I also like, I started to work with Felix around this time and, um, you know, started getting way more into house music and just like felt the, felt much more naturally um, drawn to, to house music and to more like disco and funk and that sort of stuff. And I had an epiphany of the music I 
wanted to make versus the music I'm supposed to make, right? So the music that I'm supposed to make is the music that, you know, all the all the things that we've been talking about already, you know, in the last hour and a half, mm-hmm. like Motown and reggae and pop punk and rock and roll and the Beatles and all this stuff that really is where I come from and that's what inspires me. So why am I trying to make this, you know, trap that I don't <laughs> have any relationship to or any, you know, like real tie to, um, you know, or even like this electro house that was just noisy and, you know, hype. And it's like, I'm not, I'm not noisy and I'm not hype. I'm pretty chill and relaxed. Uh, you know, so, so finding like finding your voice is really kind of, um, you know, like that song helped me find my, my musical voice. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd been doing it for a while and like, you know, obviously, so what part of my brand too, that I call is like, I, I say disco ish. If you, I don't know if you follow American politics at all, but <laughs> there was this guy, um, who got voted into, to the house of representatives here, George Santos. And, um, he was going around on the campaign trail telling people that he was Jewish and he's not, but, um, he was like, I didn't say I was. I didn't say I was a Jew. I said I was Jew-ish, like sort of Jew. <laughs> like, well, so, but so, but yeah, so my, but so my, my, my point with this is that uh, I wanted to do like a little skit that was like a CNN skit being like, I mm-hmm. didn't say I was disco. I said I was disco-ish. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice. But, so that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of the branding that I'm going with, the disco-ish. Um, but yeah, that's like- cool. That this Very song cool. helped me settle into that to that space, really. Okay, let's play the next one. Cross the line. Let's give this a whirl. Cross the line. Cross the line. go there we go gang that's cool okay the next track turn in your start turn scar your turn your turn your scar turn your scars into stars this is the this is your that's <laughs> fuck me i could I struggle with that holy crap Try again. The, the, the next track turn your scars into stars there we go um this is this little lighter moment i this is the moment i was listening to earlier this is this lighter moment we we're talking about right at the start tell us about this track and tell us about these kind of lighter moments that you, that, that you like in albums and yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this, this track is like the interlude for the album. So it's meant to break it up. And, um, it also like signifies a point in the story. Um, so that last one we just heard to cross the line, that's my friend tin. Um, and basically that song is like this sort of like fairy creature that, that you encounter in, in the woods. And she's basically giving you directions to a secret party in the woods. Um, nice. yeah, that's what the French is. It's like telling you where to go. And, um, and it's just t- talking about this party. And then, so it's like the idea that you kind of get lost at this party. And then this sort of like dreamlike, uh, you know, sort of psychedelic ambient track is sort of like the transition. You know, that's when you're like, you first get to this new world and you're looking around and you're like, oh my God, what is this new place? What are all these fairies dancing around in the woods doing? Oh my God, what are they taking? You know, <laughs> um, so but like it's, uh, it's actually in most days. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but um, it was um, it was really heavily influenced by um, Boards of Canada. They, they have this song called Olsen, and uh, it's just a really, really pretty song. And it's um, what the frig is that album called? And they have a really cool album. Um, I'm gonna butcher it if I try to think of it. But um, <laughs> the joy, the joys of the internet. It's called uh, Music Has the Right to Children. Uh, it's from 1998. 
but it's such a cool record and it's it's a lot of like ambient tracks and um you know just kind of deeper cuts and stuff like that so um I, yeah i just really wanted to show my range as i've kind of said um mm-hmm. you know i wanted to do something that was just completely not dance music um and you know like this record this album in general isn't obviously like a dance floor uh centric album you know it's really like i was as i mentioned earlier like i was listening to a lot of albums during the pandemic and i like to drive and i like to listen to full albums so um you know for inspiration during the pandemic i would drive around my car put on full album full albums listen to them all the way and smoke a joint and walk around or something <laughs> like that yeah just really get in that space and um you know i just really um found found a lot of these kind of like ambient sort of ethereal tracks where they're just you know there's a lot of a lot of pads and a lot of like evolving of uh, evolving um what's the word sorry i'm having a brain fart um just layers and stuff you know um cool. so yeah i just wanted to make something cool and that's that's what this record is and actually the um this is a fun one the the title turn your scars into stars is actually from a fortune cookie that i used to carry around in my wallet no way yeah i still have I love it that. I think. I love Uh, that. Give me one second. Let me play it while you get it. Let's play it. It's. I'll I'll play it. Let's play it. Uh, No, that one. That one. There we go. Let's let's play it. Oh, you got it. There we go. Oh wow! My my own volume. (laughs) There we are. There you go. Wow. Okay, let's play this. Go gang! Wasn't that lovely? That's so nice. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was a fun one. It's pretty. <laughs> I want to say that the artwork for the album as well is absolutely amazing. I, I've like I we've seen some of it on the screen. I absolutely love it. Like, how did that come about? Tell me about that. I love Thank you. That's yeah. That's um, something that's super super important to me personally. Is always my artwork. Um, I'm always almost always very involved with the artwork um, for all my releases, whether it's on my own label or um, whether it's on another label, unless, you know, they have like, um, you know, a kind of set formula or set, set, um, you know, like um, an ad mat or something that they do all the time. But, um, but yeah, so the concept for the record for the album art is that um, it's like a flash tattoo concept. So it's supposed to be the idea, like, you know, how some people put their, like, their, their flash tattoos on, on a wall at a tattoo parlor and you can pick which ones you want. Um, and so, um, my best friend, Matt, he designs a lot of my art and, um, he did this one for me and he's also into the tattoo stuff. And, um, you know, so I knew that he was going to kill this, but the, uh, each, each, um, each object that you see on the, on the record correlates to one of the songs. So like when I first started putting out the singles, um, you know, the singles for the artwork were so like, uh, risky business, uh, was just that mushroom there. Right. And then love reef was just the hand with the flower. And then, um, brighter day was just that bird there with the lightning bolt legs. And each one of these other images, the fairy is crossed the line the heart that was mended is still in love. Um, you know, all of the tracks themselves, they, they are just supposed to be like, um, you know, one of these songs. And the idea basically is that, you know, the songs all have kind of like significant life moments for me. 
personally. And so the idea that you get a tattoo to kind of mark one of these moments in life or these memories, that's kind of how the idea of it and how it all came together. And that's why, you know, like for each one of the singles, it was just one of them together and then they all came together for the album and it tells like a story. That's very, very cool. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, everyone's loving that. Everyone's in the chat's loving that. Yeah, I love that. (laughs) <laughs> uh wish like we're gonna uh, we're not gonna get through this album Let, let's talk about the lee scratch bay track Work, working with him must have been obviously amazing uh how did it happen like tell us about the stories behind that and then let's listen to this track all right so i'll be quick because this is kind of a lengthy story but <laughs> and i obviously <laughs> i like to ramble if you can't tell uh <laughs> so just the first little bit that i should tell you before i get into the full story but um or when i was like 10 years old my dad was on the on tour and called me up and needed me to do something, uh, send something to his agent. And so this will tell you what year it was. I had to fax something to his agent. Um, this is before no email. Fucking so. Way. so I'm like 10 years old and um, you know, I call up, it was the agency group. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They don't exist anymore. Um, but they were called mm-hmm. the agency group and they were in LA. And so I call up this guy. Um, what's his real name? His name's Val. Can't remember his last name right now. So he was my dad's agent. Call him up. You know, we talk. Get the get the information. All good. Whatever. So now, fast forward a couple of years. Um, we're working on Felix's album, and Felix had just seen um, Lee Perry's first documentary. Um, he was called The Ark of the Covenant, and um, he uh, so. Lee Perry burnt down his first studio and, um, you know, cause like it had bad vibes. He thought very interesting guy, you know, Felix was really enamored with, with Lee scratch Perry. It was like, was like, yeah, I would love to work with him on this album. I'd like, we should get him in the studio, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, actually him and my dad are friends. Like I could legitimately make that happen if you wanted to. And he's like, no way, blah, blah, blah. Like, let's do it. And I asked my dad and I was like, he, and my dad's like, yeah, like, you know, just, I was, it's like, you know who you need to talk to. And I was like, who? He's like, Val, the agent that I faxed when I was like 10 years old. So this is like now, you know, I'm like 24 year old kid or some 22 year old kid working with Felix. And I have to reach out to this agent that I was faxing when I was 10 years old. And, um, you know, I we found uh, a, a point in, in Lee's schedule. He was touring at the time and he was about to do a show at um, – this is actually a really fun story. He was uh, supposed to do a sh- – well, no, he did have a run of shows at Brooklyn Bowl in New York. You know, I reached out and coordinated and we agreed that he would come into the studio for two days before the show. And, you know, it was all cool. and. Um, when he lands in New York, his wife, Mirelle, calls me and is like, hey, like, I know we're supposed to do the session today, but we can't do it. Uh, we just got in. And do you know where we can get any weed? And all, and I'm like, uh, I was like, what do you mean you can't do the session? And so I, I had planned out the session too very perfectly because I had a huge gig of my own. So that, that other project I was saying, Chemicals of Creation, we had gotten to be like, you know, fairly popular in our area in Syracuse where I went to school. And, um, you know, it was the f- my first year out of school and we were still getting booked. But we got booked to do direct support for Avicii at this um, this uh, this um, uh, casino up in, in New York. Big, big event center. It was going to be like 3,000 people. And we were direct support. That's cool. For Avicii. Yeah, it was the Sunday. I think it was Sunday. Supposed to be. And so we were supposed to do the sessions with Lee. Friday and Saturday. So um, I go and meet Lee Perry and Muriel, his wife. And, um, you know, I brought them, brought them two ounces of weed. And uh, I, when I walk in, you know, I, I, I knock on the hotel building and it's, you know, Muriel answers the door. She's in a towel and um, Lee Perry is in the room and he's in his underwear and he's in whitey tighties. And he's just walking around the hotel room, like talking to himself and reading from a Bible. And he's combing his hair and he's like taking the comb and he's like, and he's like reading these Bible passages and like throwing out the comb. Like he's like throwing off the Holy spirit from his comb or comb or something. And I was just sitting there like, what the fuck is going on? Like, where am I? (laughs) What is happening? And you know, she's just like, like Mirella is just handling business. She's like not even bothered by, you know, this 70 year old man that's like combing out the Holy spirit from his beard and I'm like, uh, okay. I'm like trying to talk to her. I try to have a conversation, trying not to stare. And I'm like, okay, this is so interesting. 
And then she's like, yeah, we'll, we'll come tomorrow. We'll do the session tomorrow. And I was like, oh, you can't come tonight now, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm just trying to, to convince him to come. And then the next day comes around and she hits me up again. Mirelle hits me up, Lou's wife. And she's like, hey, we actually can't do the session today either. I have to go shopping. We need the money that you owe us or else we're not going to do the session. So I'm like, fuck, okay. Like I had to go to the bank, had to go back to their hotel room, had to drop off this money. And now at this point, like I am realizing that I'm probably not going to make my show the next day. And I, and I, I'm like, fuck, like, am I, what am I going to do? And I thought that, you know, maybe, maybe I'll take the show. Maybe I won't do the session. And Felix is like, no, like we can't do this session without you. We need you. You have to be here. So I had to call my friend Adam, um, who was running the show, uh, the Ceviche show. And I was like, hey, dude, like I am so sorry, but I have to cancel this show. I can't come and play. You know, I have an opportunity to work with Lee Perry, which honestly to me is just way more valuable and way more meaningful than it is to, you know, open the show for Avicii. So I'm going to take this opportunity and, um, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, you know, ultimately that, that wasn't the session that we did for this song. Um, you know, Lee and I became really good friends after that session. That was one of that session was, it was, uh, ended up being like three or four hours. I was engineering the whole time, but also like rolling joints while I was sitting here, like recording, just passing mm -hmm. him weed, like nonstop. He was just smoking for four hours straight. And like the way he records <laughs> is also super interesting. Like I would just loop the song for like five minutes. He would go on and he would just do his part and like go from the top of his head. Like, no, no, like we gave him some direction. I'd be like writing things down while he's speaking and be like, oh yeah, do this. And, um, you know, he would just go off on these tangents and like, it was really interesting because you got to see like a window into his mind and like his subconscious and sort of like his stream of thought was really interesting. You see like how it would get from one place to the next, you know, where like some people think he's, I mean, he is probably a little crazy. You really see like the wheels turning when he's, when he's going off like this. But so he would do like a 20 minute take and then want to do uh, another take, listening to the whole first take in his headphones and just going over it and would do that like three or four times. So in the end, I would have four or five takes, each one like 20 minutes. And I would just have to go through and piece together some sort of like coherentness with the vocals, <laughs> with the lyrics. And so that's what happened with, uh, so the track that I did with the, the one that I'm talking about this session, it was for a track called The Natural. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that was on Felix's album, The Narrative of Blast Illusion, which actually also my dad is playing on that record too. Um, <laughs> so that one's fun. But, um, but yeah, so I knew I wanted to work with Lee again. Um, you know, I had been to his house in Switzerland. We recorded a music video together. We had just got, like I said, we got really close. And um, yeah, I told them that I had a project that I wanted to do for myself. So they were super cool about it. Um, they were on tour in New York again. And I met up with him at Red Bull Studios in New York. And like I said, I initially had him record vocals for Risky Business and mm -hmm. didn't use them. But the vocals that you hear on Love Reach were those vocals that he recorded for uh, Risky Business that I just reappropriated. So kind of a little bit of a lengthy story, but super fun. Amazing. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Okay, let's play this record. Oh my God, that's one of the wildest stories I've ever heard. That's crazy. Fuck, fuck, about. Let's play this record. Are you ready, gang? Holy moly. <laughs> go go holy moly that's cool wicked oh man we're we're at three o'clock holy moly that was so much fun
went by fast. <laughs> it does, right? So does. mad. Thank Devin James. Thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for telling these stories. This, I mean, it's been literally, I loved every minute of it. And what a great album. Congratulations, mate. What have you got coming up for the rest of the year? Um, so I'm actually about to uh, go on a little road trip this afternoon. I'm playing in Indianapolis, Cleveland, and Chicago this weekend. And yeah, I have my girlfriend with me and we are going to take some time. She's never been to any of those cities. So we are about to drive out to, um, we're driving to Indianapolis. We're probably going to drive to Cleveland tonight, stay with some friends there tonight, and then drive down to Indianapolis tomorrow where we're both playing tomorrow at Patron Saint. And then off to Crowbar in Cleveland and then Prism in Chicago. And then got a um, bunch of stuff coming up on the horizon. Uh, we've got one of our boat parties coming up um, in June. I'm going to be in Detroit for Movement Weekend. I've got two gigs uh, playing Drunk Brunch with DJ Dan. And then nice. on Monday night, I'm playing with um, DJ Sneak and Ghetto Blaster. What else do we got? Um, oh, of course, we've mentioned this already a couple of times, but we'll say it uh, officially that both of you and I are going to be in Ibiza this summer at the, Orb- yeah. <laughs> the Orbit DJ Retreat um, run by Dorley with a lot of other awesome artists on there. I know Junior Sanchez is going to be there, Sam Devine, Gorgon City. Um, they just sold the last spot for the second week. So if you're a producer, if you're interested, sign up for the first week. There's still some spots. Um, really awesome. I mean, I, I'm sure you probably know much better than I because you've actually done it. But it's uh, you know a full week of uh, it's a great production. week. It's a great yeah yeah. It's a great week of production DJing. I'm there all week. We're gonna be chatting social. Um, that everyone gets so much out of it. And then there's like conversations and there's so much like there's so many different helpers. There's you know yeah. It's a great array of kind of mentors there, which is so good. And so many so many people get so much out of it. So. Yeah, it's wicked. I love. Um, I loved it last year, and it's good to be it's back this year. And we're going to go to Pikes. <laughs> yes, yes, it will. We'll be at Pikes. That's where. That's where our uh, <laughs> uh, graduation party or something. <laughs> On the midweek trip to Pikes. Wicked. Um, thank you so much for doing this. It's been so good to talk to you. Actually, finally good to talk to you after we've emailed right. so much. And I look forward to just hanging out with you at Pike uh, in Ibiza this summer. And I hope the album goes so well because I, I loved the album. I loved to listen to it. I can't wait to hear it again. Um, gang, I hope you liked it in the chat. But Devin James, thank you for being here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Graham. Yeah, it's great to finally chat with you and appreciate everyone sticking with us, listening through everything. And I uh, just appreciate the support and everything. So, you know, especially for you, Graham, I, you've been supporting me for a long time now. So it's, uh, you know, I can't, can't thank you enough for all that. And um, it's really fun to be here. And thank you for having me. No worries. It's all good. I can't wait to hear it. Send me some more music from the, from the label. I can't wait to hear some more of it. Always. I will. I will. And make sure you check out Super Taste. I'm going to. Yes. Yeah, send me yeah. some music for that, but I'm going to go and, I'm going to go and find them in a minute and go and, and, go and listen to them. I will. I will. You'll 100%. love it. 100%. Wicked. Right. I'll let you go. See you soon. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye, mate. Bye. If you found this interview interesting, consider giving it a like and a comment. It helps with the YouTube algorithm and let me know your biggest takeaway below. Don't forget to follow me on Twitch. I'm back on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and you can check out the schedule from the link below as well to see who's coming up in my interview series. I'll see you in the next Twitch stream or the next YouTube video. I'll see you soon. Bye.